Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hi, I'm Joel Simmons. Welcome to this week's version of the Earthworks Podcast. We're going to do something a little bit different this week than we've been doing in weeks past. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the founding member of Earthworks, uh, the gentleman that uh, I started the company with back in 1988, Mr. Jerry Bernetti. Unfortunately, as uh, many of you know, we lost Jerry to a, uh, a battle of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma many years ago, uh, but his memory stays with us. We talk to him on a regular basis, uh, and in the last few weeks, I've been uh, playing and listening to a number of uh, video clips that are available on YouTube and listening to some of uh, his talks. Uh, I share this often, but uh, uh, Jerry wrote a book a few years ago called uh, Farm as Ecosystem. Uh, and when he, uh, when he wrote the book, uh, he gave it to me. He gave me a copy. And, and he said to me, he goes, you know, I'd like you to read this and, and let me know what you think. And, and I, I was honored and I, I took the book home and I, I studied it and I read it. And I came back and I said, Jerry, you, you, can't, you can't publish this book. And he looked at me and goes, you don't like it? I said, no, I think it's brilliant. Uh, but if you publish this book, everybody's going to know I'm a fraud because everything that I've ever done, uh, I learned from Jerry, really. I mean, most of my agronomic uh, background came from my work with Jerry. Uh, he was my mentor. He was my business partner. Um, he, you know, basically taught me everything I knew. In fact, what he really did was he de-educated me from my university uh, education process, and uh, and it was quite a quite an experience. I mean, he, he took years to do it, but he uh, he, he was able to. Um, to really take this young guy and uh, who had you know a lot of time in the university learning soils and horticulture and and teach him uh, the way that it really really does work. Um, just to give you a quick background, and I'm not going to go the, into great detail on on earthworks, but um, Jerry and I got to know each other when I was a county extension agent here in Northampton County, Pennsylvania, where our office is still currently uh, situated. Um, I got to know a gentleman in the grape growing industry, a gentleman by the name of Charles Flatt. And uh, Charles and I became uh, pretty good friends, and, and uh, I spent a lot of time on his farm. Uh, taught me a lot about uh, grapes at the time. I was a very young man. Uh, and one day, Charles came to me and said, I've got to introduce you to this guy. Um, he lives down the hill, uh, really good guy, uh, and he's very, very smart. And I quite honestly don't know what the heck he's talking about half the time, but I think you might. And that person was Jerry Bernetti. At the time, Jerry was running an animal health care business called Agrodynamics, a business that's still very much uh, in business today, uh, dealing with mostly uh, animal health care crops and things of that nature. Um, I left Extension, uh, got into other businesses, uh, but always had a passion for what we were doing and stayed very close to Jerry as a friend. Uh, and uh, at one point, he came to me and said, "Why don't we? Uh, why don't you come back and you know, kind of work with me, and let's you know, do something, you know, that you you would be happy with." So we actually started to do this as a um, franchise lawn care company. We formulated uh, our our two products, Kick, which is still very much a, a major product for us now, and our biggest selling product, the Replenish Five Four Five. Those were the two products that we were going to. Um, basically take out into the lawn care world and make our way. Um, and I remember vividly, I, um, I quit my job. I was making a decent living at the time as a relatively young man in my early 30s. And I, um, I called up Jerry, and, and this is after you know two years of building business plans and formulating products and, and doing all these things. I called up Jerry and I said to him, <laughs> I said, uh, you know, I really don't want to be a lawn care company. Why don't we just manufacture these products and start 
um, you know, selling them to the industry. And of course, he had said to me, uh, well, I've been trying to tell you that for six months. Uh, you don't listen very well, but that's what we ended up doing is we started manufacturing products, uh, products that Jerry, for the most part, was formulating. And, and uh, as you see some of the clips that we're going to show here in a minute, you'll kind of get a feel for where he was going in terms of formulation. So we started out very small. I started uh, literally going to the to the uh, library with a bag of dimes. Why do you ask a bag of dimes? Because that's what it would cost to photocopy. Uh, this is back in the early 90s before computers or smartphones or any of that stuff. So all I had to work from was a, uh, a yellow page. Uh, and uh, yeah, what's a yellow page? Uh, that's the old phone book uh, that probably a lot of you don't even know uh, existed at, at any point in time. Uh, but I would go to the phone book and photocopy all the lawn care companies in the tri-state area. And I'd go down the list and cold call them. Our first couple years, we sold enough guys to at least keep food on the table. Uh, and as the years grew, we got to meet uh, people like Tom Briner at Fiddler's Elbow uh, and Glenn Smickley and John Chassard, who we've already interviewed here on this podcast. And we started moving down the road of getting into the golf course industry, and Jerry started formulating even more products. Uh, but again, as, as what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to show you some of the clips uh, from some of his talks uh, and, and let you hear in his voice, in his words, uh, and hear his passion as he spoke. Um, Jerry was truly a, uh, a student of nature. I think that's really what gave him his guidance, is that he studied nature. He studied a lot of things. He was a very prolific reader, uh, and, and uh, he, he quick, quickly picked up on a lot of things. Um, the first clip I'm going to show you is a talk, actually all the clips I'll show you today are from a talk that he did in Australia. And uh, during the, the last part of his career, he spent a lot of time in Australia. Uh, he was invited down many times. He, he met a lot of f folks and became very friendly with. Uh, did a lot of lectures and, and toured Australia quite a bit. Learned a lot. Uh, brought back to us a lot of information on different soil types and uh, different thought processes. Uh, it's always good to get out and about and uh, and see what other people are doing, and he did that. Um, so this talk that uh, I'm going to share with you in pieces, uh, he entitled Soil as Supraorganism. And again, as you have heard me talk in my academies, um, you know, we talk a lot about biological soil management. And, and although Jerry's not using that term in this talk, you'll see what he's talking about in terms of the biological soil focus. And that's really what this is all about. This is kind of the introduction uh, to this talk, but one of the things that he really talks about here is is understanding limiting factors, and we talk a lot about that when when I uh, when I present the Soil Academy, uh, and one of the things that we always talk about, and I talked about when I was a instructor at Rutgers, and I've certainly talked about in all of my academies, is that the most important nutrient in turf is oxygen. And uh, you'll hear Jerry talk about that, and you'll probably also get to know that uh, uh, this is where I got it from. So this is Jerry uh, introducing a talk. Again, he's talking a lot about farming, so please bear with. But but try to understand you know where he's coming from. Uh, certainly, I, I hope you feel his passion for biological soil management. Uh, I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more and then show you another clip. Uh, but this is Jerry talking um, uh, at an introduction of a talk, uh, and you're going to see him talking a lot about the, the, the importance of oxygen in the soil. Here's Jerry. So uh, I was delighted to see uh, the front page uh, headliner of National Geographic because um, they actually did pay an awful lot of reverence to a soil organism as opposed to just being topsoil that has kind of an inert quality or character to it that's merely supposed to hold plants upright. So uh, it's very encouraging to see that it's getting the recognition that you know folks like yourself have given it for more than a few years. So when we're dealing with these <clears throat> organisms within organisms, super organisms, what we're dealing with here, we, we, and this is kind of things that I talk with my farmers all the time, start thinking about soil as ecosystems within ecosystems. So we have, you know, we have what we call the lithosphere, uh, which is the mineral component or portion of the soil. We have the hydrosphere, which is the fluids, predominantly water, which I'm going to talk about. Um, we have the biosphere, which are all the inhabitants, living 
biological inhabitants of this ecosystem. And then we have the atmosphere, which are the gaseous <coughs> byproducts of exchanges between the inorganic and the organic uh, realm. Uh, one of my teachers um, back in the late 70s and early 80s was a, a fairly renowned agronomist by the name of Don Schriefer uh, from uh, Lamont, Indiana, and uh, who's since passed from the scene. And Don wrote two books that were published by Acres USA. One is called From the Soil Up, and the other one was called Agriculture and Transition. And he was primarily a, a crop agronomist, but he also worked with people growing hort and, hort and uh, orchards and, and livestock. Um, being in the Midwest, most of his clientele were the folks that were corn and bean, wheat, and hay farmers. But he was always emphasizing you got to basically take the pulse of your landscape. Take the pulse of your landscape like you're a physician taking the pulse of your patient. And ask yourself basically the question of what are your yield limiting factors? What are your yield limiting factors? And so he said that you know, essentially you have to look at it from the standpoint of what biology really depends on first and foremost, secondarily, and then downstream. And what he was saying was that <clears throat> the very first thing you have to deal with is managing your atmosphere. Because uh, essentially the most important nutrient in the soil isn't nitrogen or calcium, phosphorus and such, it's oxygen because it's an aerobic. And so aerobic ecosystems, of course, first and foremost depend on the 21% oxygen that's in the atmosphere, but in the soil, the atmosphere is a little lower. It's about maybe 15% in a healthy aerobic environment. And that's, of course, where you see the fence post always rotting, right? In that top four inches, which is where the aerobic zone is. And what the, the, the objective here is to try to get that four inch fence post rotting zone down another foot, maybe deeper. You know, not that you want your fence post to rot that completely, but you know, if you, use, if you use locust, you won't have to worry about that, right? So the number one is atmosphere. And then once you start managing atmosphere, you have a chance to manage water. Because if you have atmosphere, it means you have pore space. You have pore space, you have infiltration opportunities. So then you manage water, and that's also a manage of, of carbon. But actually, you can't really manage carbon unless you have digestion, which is another word for decay. So you have to manage digestion, which is basically pulsing the root systems, getting the organic uh, residues to, to decompose instead of burning them. I was reading, uh, realized now that in Australia, one of the farm papers I saw at the airport, you know, there seems to be more emphasis on, on stubble mulching, you know, getting your stuff ground up so that there's more surface area so that the fungi, the bacteria can start breaking down these car carboniferous residues from your previous crop. So there's more emphasis on that. And last but not least is fertility. And you know, when you look at a lot of people who recommend uh, how to grow a crop, you know, and I was one of them once upon a time, it was fertility first. Whether you're an NPK manager or you're looking at other elements like calcium, phosphorus, zinc, whatever it might be. And it's not that fertility is of least consideration, it's that you can't really get good fertility uh, returns on your investment if you don't have a good ecosystem that's Im embodied with the right kinds of atmosphere, the digestion, and the um, <coughs> water management issues. So I don't know if <coughs> all of you have one of these. I think every farm should have one of these tools because this is a measure of compaction and the depth of the compaction called the plow pan or the hard pan, in some cases what we call the fragile pan, which is a geological pan. Uh, but what I call this is, is an oxygen meter. That, not that it measures oxygen, what it's measuring is pounds per square inch. And what I like about this tool tells me exactly what the PSIs are and where the PSI start to get deep. So if I start getting into that red zone, which is getting into the 300 pounds per square inch zone, what that says to me right now is root growth starts to halt abruptly. Because roots don't want to grow into an anaerobic environment because there's no life there. At least not the aerobic life that uh, aerobic plants depend upon. So that tells me exactly where <coughs> my pans are depth wise because there's uh, demarcations on the rod and it tells me specifically how tight the pans are, and then I can also find out how thick the pans are. So how deep, how tight, and the thickness of that pan. And sometimes, basically, what I see in, I'd say 90 plus percent of my clients, and a lot of these guys are livestock with perennial polycultures of grass and meadows, we have a lot of compaction. Now, in my country, that ground that's currently being managed, let's say, with a perennial polyculture, has been plowed for 300 years, albeit with horses, but horses and plows compact soil. 
Cows walking on top of ground compact soil. And then we end up coming up with heavier equipment. Now the guys that are mechanized, you know, more, <coughs> more machinery, more horsepower, and we have more compaction. Then throw in salt fertilizers, throw in fungicides, herbicides, and all kinds of sides except suicide, perhaps. And you end up with a dead zone that really does interfere with the efficiency of your fertility program in a big, big, big way. I mean, this is a huge issue with drought. Huge issue with drought. And most people say, I, I don't understand, I spent all this money on lime and, and rock phosphate and foliar sprays, and you know, we just can't seem to get the return on investment. And the reason why is because you don't have the number one fertility uh, being taken care of, which is oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, what good is calcium? Hopefully that made some sense. Uh, again, you could see the importance uh, that Jerry put on um, getting the soil right. Jerry did a lot of things. Um, he was a, um, a great lawyer. He was a doctor. Uh, I think many of you that knew Jerry um, knew that he had a 15-year battle with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he actually toured the world. He, um, he did a lecture series called Food is Medicine, which was really based around uh, his approach to human health. And one of the things that Jerry uh, taught me very early on in, uh, in my career working with Jerry was that the connection between soil health and animal health and, and ultimately human health uh, is a direct circle. And, and uh, I remember many times him telling me stories of getting called into a farm uh, where he would uh, be asked to help uh, a farmer's cow who was down uh, and sick. And he would go in and, and look at the cow and do his evaluation on the cow. And then he would come back and say to the farmer, um, I would like to see your soil test, which often uh, confused and kind of blew away the farmer and saying, you know, why, what are you talking about soil tests? My cow's sick. And he goes, yeah, but your cow's sick because your cow is eating uh, crops that are not not getting the proper nutrition. So he, um, you know, he would come full circle and talk about the importance of, uh, of that soil uh, to bring in the minerals that the uh, crops need to feed the cows and then ultimately, obviously, to feed us. So uh, when he did his lecture series as Food is Medicine, he was talking about good quality food grown on good quality soil. So everything has always come back uh, to the soil. He actually produced a, a DVD that is, uh, I think, still available through Acre. Uh, but the DVD is, is entitled uh, Cancer, Nutrition, and Healing, uh, and it's basically a lecture of, of Jerry's walking around his house making, uh, you know, food and smoothies and things that helped, um, you know, people get better. And, and I recall vividly in, his, uh, in, in the last number of years that Jerry was with us that um, he spent a lot of time and a lot of his passion uh, helping people that were sick and helping them find ways to eat better. The next clip I'm going to talk about or show you here that Jerry uh, did in this lecture series in Australia, um, he's now starting to talk about um, all sorts of biological uh, inputs. Uh, you know, he's got a couple slides in here that uh, many of you might have seen of mine in my uh, in my academy, because again, I have uh, stolen most of my slides from Jerry, but he talks about uh, uh, mycorrhizae. He talks about colloidal structures. Uh, one of the most interesting things that he discovered that we didn't know anything about until Jerry started talking to us about was, was the uh, work done by the USDA uh, on glomalin. And glomalin is the byproduct of mycorrhizae. Uh, and, and without glomalin in the soil, the soil biologically is not going to perform as well. Um, from that work, uh, we started formulating products with mycorrhizae in it, endo and ecto. We have a product called Myco Replenish, which is an endo ecto mycorrhizae, which has truly become one of our more powerful tools in helping build soils, uh, certainly in the turf industry where, uh, you know, we're growing a very short crop. Uh, it's not an animal-cycled crop like we were talking about earlier, but it is one that is very dependent on soil biology, and the mycorrhizae uh, work that we're seeing within the turf industry has been very uh, effective. So uh, this is a little longer clip, but you can get, a, an, again, an idea of, uh, of his passion uh, when he starts talking about... Um, 
uh, about microbiology and about how important microbiology is uh, and about soil structure and, and all of that stuff. So hopefully uh, you enjoy this piece as well and again can, uh, can really feel uh, his passion for, uh, for the soil piece that uh, he's talking about in this part of his lecture. Enjoy. You know, when you're looking at the types of soils you have, it's based on whether or not you have this percentage of silt, that percentage of clay, this percentage of, of sand, and then everything that's an aggregate that holds it together, hopefully, hopefully, humus. So when we're talking about surface area, we're talking about trying to create, and I, you know, and I know most people curse clay because clay, when it's not cooperating with you, can be asphalt parking lots. It can be incredibly difficult. But I'll take a clay soil that I can remediate any day over a sandy soil that takes me a long time, almost never able to remediate. Particularly sandy soil that's got a CEC of around two to three. Because it's really, really difficult to get surface area, which is habitat, right? People, things, animals live in homes. You need habitat. And so what this is is a, is a high school experiment showing how do you create surface area? How does nature create surface area? This is called the Koch snowflake. You know, superimposing triangles eventually give you, you know, this coastline. And the state of Maine is an example of that. So if you drive from Portland down here up to New Brunswick, Canada, that's 300 miles. If you walk along this irregular coastline as a human, it's 3,000 miles. What if you're a dog? What if you're an ant? <clears throat> what if you're a microbe? How far is that regular coastline? You see where I'm getting at? It's nature's way of creating infinity within a finite constraint. That's, that's the Coke snowflake thing. So enormous surface area is what colloidal chemistry is all about. You know, we make, um, we make uh, natural fertility products using an organic surfactant, and what we create in there is called a micelle, which is a colloidal cluster, allowing that <clears throat> particulate to have more reactivity opportunity in the soil or on the plant surface. That's colloidal chemistry. You could take this experiment, that's basically steel wool ground up very fine and you can ignite it with a Bunsen burner. The same weight of, of steel in the nail, of course you can't ignite. The only difference is the surface area. That's the only difference that allows it to be what? Combustible. So what we're saying is surface area in the form of colloids create opportunities for biology and chemistry to, to occur. Now this is right out of the college textbooks, The Nature and Property of Soils by Brady and Wild, up to the 17th edition now. How big is your soil? Now, <clears throat> what they say in that, soil, in that soil book is that clay range is that if you have a, a, a soccer field and you go down five feet and half of that total earth mass is 50% clay, roughly, that the surface area of that soccer field five feet deep is the size of the continental United States. A cubic inch of clay is seven and a half acres of surface area. Now that could be <clears throat> a great thing or it could be a nightmare if you have non-living soils that are loaded with no humic materials, no root systems, no airification opportunities. It's just clay. That's a brick. So what do we want is we want, clay is like a, a, a deck of cards. So what you want is that deck of cards to open up like a bellows, like an accordion. And once you open it up and you fill it up with organic materials like humic materials, you get a marriage between humic materials and clay, now you're singing. You know, now, now you're getting somewhere. So clays are <clears throat> extremely important because they're silicates, and silicates store information. If we're talking about biological systems communicating and storing information, clays are the semiconductors in your soil. This is out of the New York Times. Can assemble in varied shapes. Many domains of disorder from isomorphic substitutions. All that means is it's plastic. It means that clays can actually interfere or substitute for things that are missing. Um, and I think this is where uh, Louis Curvon's work actually is steeped in, this idea of transmutation of elements based on electricity and, and all kinds of opportunities that exist in this electromagnetic field that clay creates. Clay moistened with water, solvents, irradiated, fractured, will emanate ultraviolet light and other light wavelengths up to years. And I'll get into this soon here with the photomultiplier that uh, Fritz Albert Pop has developed to measure what? Light communication. So this is basically a computerized <clears throat> replication of what fractal infinity can look like. This little square here is replicated with this thing right here. It goes on and it goes on and it goes on. So nature has an opportunity to be incredibly creative within the confines of, of limitations that it has. 
So here's where the rubber meets the road. The root tip exudates, this is with the Dittmer work, you know, out of the University of Iowa in the 30s. What you see here are tremendous numbers of bacteria being fed, now this is protein, which is nitrogen, being fed by a whole suite coming out of that root system. And so it, 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 it replicates what goes on everywhere. In animals, this is the villi of the intestine. Here's unhealthy villi, here's healthy villi. The same models are repeated over and over again in biological systems. Most importantly about building root systems is if that 50, 60% of what we're making up in the top canopy can dump down in the basement. Well, now we're talking about <clears throat> actually having an opportunity to take sunlight, crystallize it, liquefy it, and put it where you want it, you know, down in the basement. So the rhizosphere, the root ball, we call the nectar of the roots. We're always looking at the nectar of blossoms, but the nectar of the roots, very complex stuff. It's one of the reasons why you can take good soil, put it up to your nose, and you can smell the aromatics, the terpenes, the phenols. These are the same things you find on the leaf, or in the bark, or in the blossom. These aromatic compounds are dumped into the root system like they are also uh, dumped into the atmosphere to attract pollinators. Nucleotides, fats, mucigels, all kinds of stuff. Very complex material. It's only 1% one one to 5% of the soil volume. Therefore, it's really important to understand why you need to thick sward. Because the rhizosphere is very, very uh, confined. The root ball. Uh, the rhizosphere is no more than 5 millimeters from the root surface. And the microbial population is 10 to 100 times higher there than the other soil. And this is interesting to me. Microbes only occupy 7 to 15 percent of the actual root surface. So where are they living? Go back to that little photograph of that root ball. It's right around the edges where all the food is being dumped. Right there. So that means lots of roots, lots of rhizosphere, lots of rhizosphere, lots of sunlight getting liquefied into all these other compounds dumped into the basement. And organic compounds are very complex, as you can see up here. Many, many things other than sugar, fats, lipids, carbohydrates of many kinds, tannins. If you see a stream, in my neck of the woods we have autumn, the deciduous leaves fall off the trees, they end up in the streams, and they actually turn the streams tan, like tannin, right? Tannins are very purifying. Very, they're very, very powerful cleansers. And this is the stream's way of cleansing itself at the end of the summer. Mucigel, the lubricants that protect the roots from drought. Lots of mucigel means more drought resistance, and mucigel is also a lubricant allowing roots to penetrate deeper. And this is just some of the things that are in mucigel. A very complex carbohydrate amino acid profile there. So glomalin is produced by the mycorrhizal fungus, which in inhabits 90% of the Earth's plants, root systems. And this was discovered, believe it or not, by Dr. Sarah Wright, USDA, 1996. That's how little we know about glomalin. And this is the compound that represents an average of 27% of the soil carbon, which is an exudate, a secretion from a fungus. 27%. It's as high as 40%. That's an amazing... And when I was just into this work about 30 years ago, I never could figure out, never could figure out why somebody who abused their soils with monocropping, no cover cropping, lots of hard chemistry, and you go to that soil every year and test it, and it was still 2% organic matter. <clears throat> So Albert Schatz is the guy who invented streptomycin. He wrote this book in 1954 and another one in 1963, Chelation as a Biological Weathering Factory in Soil Formation or Pedogenesis, or The Importance of Metal Binding Phenomena in the Chemistry of Microbiology Soil. The first book wouldn't even be published in the United States. He had to publish it in India, right? And this is the guy who dis discovered streptomycin, which is an actinomycetes secretion, which became a powerful, effective human antibiotic. So this flashes back to some of the work that was done by uh, other individuals looking at the explorations of Hiram Bingham, who was a U.S. senator and an uh, academic up at Harvard and Yale, Machu Picchu in Cusco, where the Cusco fortresses, when they're looking at these walls where the blocks weighed anywhere from 20 tons to 300 tons, they couldn't figure out how they put these blocks together without any mortar. And they couldn't even get a penknife in, in the crevasses between the, and the stones. And there was a an English explorer <clears throat> that actually came up with the theory that they think it was what the pedo bird does. And the pedo bird uses this plant called the Haraaka ama plant to basically take it and pound it into the rock, the basalt rock cliffs, and carve out a, a nesting cavity. <clears throat> and the reason why he found this out is because he ended up traveling through a field of this plant not knowing what it was, and the spurs on his boots dissolved. 
And when we got to the other side of this field, he asked the natives what happened to his spurs, and they asked him if he went through a field that had plants that had these red pigments to it, and he said, yes. And they said, the plants ate your spurs. And they found out that the pedo bird <coughs> uses this plant to actually chelate, okay, softens the clay, or softens rock, hard rock, into a clay, so they can actually carve a hole out of this, out of this rock. They think that's what the Inca has used to soften the rocks so they can actually cut them with the tools. They didn't have diamond tip blades, you know. Lichen is an example of that. This is a chelating compound. 36% of the dry weight are chelators. You see them everywhere. Primitive plant, it's an algae and a fungus marriage is what it is. The algae fix uh, sugar from sunlight and the lichen <coughs> fix minerals from the rock. You know, are also produced by compost, but they're also produced by natural soil systems. What we know with humic acids is they're chelating agents. So everything out here that's how do we get minerals into a solution is with chelating agents. So we have things like glomalin, we have things like humic acids, and humic acids actually were discovered as an agricultural boon because they were used in the oil industry to open up salt domes in the wells because when they hit the bit, when the bit hit the salt dome, I should say, they would wear out. So they throw humic acids in there, it would flocculate the salt, chelate the salt, soften the salt, just like that pedo bird did, and allow those bits to get through those salt domes. Found out, well, maybe you can actually sequester and chelate salt deposits from sodic irrigation water, and sure enough, it works. But nature makes humic acids constantly, as it does make fulvic acids. And you can stabilize all of these soluble anions, like boron and iodine and selenium and chromium and nitrate, with humic acids. Clays don't hold on to negatively charged substances, because clays themselves are negative. So here's a humic acid, it's what we call amphoteric, meaning it can hold on to positive things, it can hold on to negative things. Therefore, humus is the ultimate, ultimate substance you want in the soil. Jerry talks a lot about nitrification in his talks, and he taught me a lot about nitrification. And those of you that have seen me uh, at the Academy or uh, even in some of our two-minute talks, I've talked about nitrification a lot. And the simplicity of nitrification in, in, in what we're dealing with within turf is this process of breaking down nitrogen into plant-usable forms. And Jerry does talk about this. One of the, uh, I think one of the strengths that uh, I was able to gain, uh, and, and you guys have probably already gathered this by watching a couple clips of Jerry. Jerry was brilliant in many, many ways. Um, very, uh, you know, he's a very big thinker and, and sometimes a little bit hard to, uh, uh, to really understand uh, every piece of what he's talking about. If you have the uh, chance to read his book, uh, The Farm as Ecosystem, it, it's not an easy read, but it's a thorough read. And I've had many, many clients come to me and, and sales reps telling me that they read this book and found it hard to read, but really get, got a lot out of it. Uh, I remember going through uh, the conversation of nitrification with Jerry, and, and it wasn't an easy conversation to really fully understand, but after uh, listening to him a number of times, um, I was able to really kind of digest uh, nitrification, and, and again, I think what my strength was was taking uh, this really heady information and digesting it into forms that uh, most of us can understand. And when you uh, come to a, a soil academy, we go through the diagram of nitrification pretty thoroughly. And the simplicity of nitrification in our world is simply this concept of working with carbon to nitrogen. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll do my best to explain it, then I'm going to leave that up to Jerry in the next clip. Uh, but nitrification is, you know, as an example in the turf world, you know, we may apply urea. Uh, to the turf to green it up to get get everything going and and most of us that went through education uh, on 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 uh, horticulture and, and agriculture and turf uh, nitrogen was king I mean that's what they talked a lot about and certainly in the turf industry you know uh, you know you've heard many folks come to you and say you know all you need is nitrogen just pound the place with nitrogen and 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 the the reality of that is that over nitrifying a soil burns out the carbon. So what the nitrification process talks about is this management of carbon to nitrogen ratio. And if we don't have adequate amounts of carbon in the soil, uh, then nitrification isn't going to occur. So uh, Jerry's going to talk about nitrification, but the reality here is that uh, what carbon-based fertility and what biological soil management is really all about is getting enough carbon into the system so nitrification works efficiently and effectively. 
Uh, I think you heard in the podcast that we did with uh, both Glenn Smickley and John Chassard, um, both of them were uh, students of reducing nitrogen. Uh, I remember John coming to me at one point and saying, would it be okay if I was at a half a pound of N for the year? And I thought he was kidding. And, uh, and he wasn't. Uh, half a pound is a little light. I mean, you want to keep some vigor going on in your golf course. And he found that out, but he's been consistently, and many of our clients have consistently been able to produce good quality turf at a pound or just slightly over a pound uh, per thousand per season, uh, which is unheard of in conventional wisdom. But the reason why that's working is because we, we changed the carbon to nitrogen ratio. We applied carbon-based fertility that allowed microbiology to be a major part of the play. And we also made nitrification work better. So the way this works is that, you know, you apply, uh, um, again, I'll use urea, you apply urea to the uh, soil profile. And, and what happens is that molecule has to be broken down in the soil into plant available forms. It starts with um, breaking it down to ammonium. And Jerry will talk about ammonium in this clip uh, a, a bit. And then it goes from NH4 into a nitrite, NO2, and then it's broken down another step into NO3, nitrate, and that's the form that the plant takes up. And he brings that into, uh, in, into his discussion here. All of that is done through microbial degradation, and microbes need to have energy, just like we need to have energy, or your truck needs to have gasoline in order for it to run down the, um, you know, run down the road. So what we're trying to do is make sure that there's enough food energy in that soil, so that when we do apply nitrogen, it goes through nitrification completely efficiently, so we can use less. And remember that in the process of keeping microbiology strong you're also releasing free nitrogen because a microbe releases and you know excretes ammonium, which is a nitrogen form that your plants will be able to take up. So um, take a listen to what Jerry has to say. I think he explains it a lot better than I do. Um, and uh, we're going to continue uh, this, this little uh, Jerry Brunetti conversation uh, perhaps on a different podcast, but uh, take a look at what he has to say about nitrification, and uh, I'll come back and, uh, and wrap things up for you. Thank nitrate you. Nitrate or ammonium. But plants grow best when you have a combination of nitrate and ammonium. And the reason for that, according to Don Schrieffer, one of my teachers back in the 80s, was that there's less enzymatic requirements to convert ammonium into protein precursors than there is to convert nitrate into protein precursors. So we like a little bit of ammonium in, in the soup with the nitrate so the plants don't have to expend as much energy to synthesize complete protein. So the nitrate ends up in the cytoplasm of the roots and the shoots, and the ammonium ends up in the chloroplast or the leaves. Nitrate conversion, here's what I just said, requires significant enzymes and energy. There's 15 moles of ATP versus five moles of ATP to convert to ammonium. So that's why you won't see as much ammonium in the soil as you will nitrate, but a little bit of ammonium goes a long ways in being able to have that plant conserve energy to, to send those compounds, those energy compounds, to other, other important parts like filling fruit or putting sugar in the, in the leaf tips. Obstacles to photosynthesis, too much nitrogen, Excess nitrogen actually creates an uptake of too much water. An uptake of too much water with nitrogen creates this funny protein phenomena. Funny protein phenomena creates the appetite for insects, diseases, and sick animals uh, as a consequence. Deficiency of proteosynthesis. Proteosynthesis versus proteolysis. Proteosynthesis is making complete protein. Remember, there's about 22 amino acids, and that's it, only 22. And yet, we're talking about building the potential of 50,000 different proteins with just the various combinations of the 22 amino acids. And that takes enzymes to do that. And enzymes depend on macro and micronutrients. They also depend on cofactors, like vitamins, uh, in the process to make these finished products. Pesticide applications interfere with proteosynthesis. Uh, mineral ion shortages interfere with it. Dry condition, conditions or compaction, I talked about compaction this morning, which infects what? Uptake of water and minerals. Toxic irrigation water. Um, out west, western United States, we have a lot of recycled municipal wastewater that's loaded with excessive amounts of carbonates and bicarbonates. 
also at very high levels of sodium, but that's the only water they have because they get two inches of actual rainfall a year on some of these irrigated uh, uh, crop lands and golf courses in Arizona and Nevada. So you're really stuck with a situation where the water is so detrimental. To not have water means no crop. To have uh, salty irrigation water means you're going to have basically prop, uh, diseases and insects because there's no way that plant can use really good water or bad water that way and end up with the finished product that you're trying to have in a healthy crop. Recycling of mobile nutrients to younger tissues. As the older tissues senesce or they die, those amino acids are recycled down to the younger tissue. So what does that mean? Well, if you don't have finished proteins, those leaves that haven't finished making protein prematurely die. And so there's a constantly a recycling of that nitrogen. Chlor chlorophyll is an, an example of nitrogen. In, in the Northeast, we have autumn. And autumn is when the leaves change color. And really, they don't really change color. What happens is they lose the green color which is chlorophyll, because chlorophyll is rich in nitrogen, and the deciduous trees migrate or mobilize that chlorophyll into the root for next year. Through the wintertime, it stays dormant, and then it resurrects that nitrogen back in the spring. So what you see under that chlorophyll mask is this rainbow of orange and yellow and red, and these are all the carotenoids or carotenes that you see under the green pigment. Plant proteolysis, so high nitrogen fertilizers. This is, this is the problem I'm talking about. Excessive amounts of free amino acids in the plant tissue. Okay, so protein is a mixture of bricks. The bricks are amino acids that hook chains together called peptides. The peptides hook together and make basically blocks, and blocks hook together and make this wall. That's the complete protein process. If you don't have that process finished because of enzymatic deficiencies and other reasons of, of, of interference because of pesticide interference, shutting down the enzyme systems, or too much nitrogen, too much nitrogen, you end up with what they call free amino acids. In other words, they're not linked together. And free amino acids are, in effect, a buffet for diseases and insects. That's one of the reasons why trace minerals like boron are so effective, oftentimes in arresting the development of insects and diseases because boron and manganese and copper and zinc are catalysts in produ producing these enzymes that allow these finished protein compounds to be accomplished. So what we have is, in effect, the xylem where things are taken out of the soil here. This is going up, but it's actually laying down. And so we have nitrate and ammonium and we have amino acid metabolism forming these free amino acids. Carbohydrates are produced by photosynthesis. Carbohydrates plus amino acids make true, pr true protein instead of funny protein. And then half of this is dumped down into the root systems. That's what we call the, the nectar of the roots of the rhizosphere. This is, in, in effect, nurturing the livestock of the soil with these compounds that they need, al along with all the aromatic compounds um, things like alkaloids that actually inhibit the uh, proliferation of nematodes, things like terpenoids, which inhibit the, the uh, growth of, uh, of fungal diseases that attack root systems. Plant immunity depends on the following, cross-linking proteins, cross-linking, in other words, coupling, hooking up instead of having free amino acids. Cell deaths. Surround fungus releases acids to contain the pathogen. So that takes a lot of energy. When a plant's being attacked by a fungus, there's a tremendous amount of energy focused just on where the damaged tissue is, which takes away from what? Production. It also takes away from the quality of the fruit, if you're growing fruit or nuts. Surrounding cells produce phytoalexins. What are those? That's the, and I'll talk about this uh, Saturday, I guess. Phytoalexins are the 911 responders. Phytoalexins happen within a very short period of time. Within 48 hours of a plant being smitten or bitten by a pathogen, the entire phytochemistry of that plant can actually come to the aid of that damaged area so that the disease does not progress and there isn't a crop failure, provided that there's enough nutrition, provided that the protein is not funny protein. If you have a, an abundance of this funny protein, you can't produce the phytoalexins, these 911 responders. And these are some of the things that are in these phytoalexins or these 911 responders. So we have things like phenols, hydrocyanic acid, that's cyanide. Which plants are high naturally in cyanides? Brassicas, right? They're called isothiocyanates. It's one of the reasons why they're so good against cancer, because cyanide is actually very good for preventing cancer, you know? 
There are lethal doses of cyanide, and there's therapeutic doses of cyanide. Anybody ever hear of laetril? Laetril from apricot pits, it got vilified years ago. The active ingredient in laetril or apricot pits is another form of cyanide. And cyanide compounds in these plant forms are incredibly effective at detoxifying the liver. So when you have cancer, or you have some other kind of chronic illness that has an association with liver contamination, you want to eat lots of cruciferous vegetables, particularly if they're fermented, because they cause, what's the, they cause a uh, conjugation of the toxin. In other words, it binds it and helps you eliminate it through the gallbladder. And this is, plants do the same thing. These are conjugators, right? They actually pick up toxins. Glutathione is another conjugator. Plants and animals and people work on very, very similar principles, principles in terms of detoxification. Organic acids like citric acid, acetic acid, which is also called vinegar, one of the best uh, panaceas for human and beast. Um, also a great additive for your foliar sprays. Anybody ever use acetic acid in your foliar sprays? Anybody use it? Yes? No? Try it sometime. Yes, do you use acetic acid, some vinegar in your foliar sprays? Uh, mix it with um, lime. Mix it with what? Lime. 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 Oh, lime. Oh, to make the lime more available, right? Okay. So amino acids like glycine and methionine, phenylalanine, these are all precursors to make things like glutathione. Um, and then also foliar sprays, you can manipulate, it's called uh, induced systemic resistance. Anybody here of induced systemic resistance? You know, SARs are acquired systemic resistance. That's when plants cause this immune response to occur where phytoalexins, the 911 responders show up. You can actually trick plants into doing this with things like vitamin C or salicylic acid, uh, which is aspirin. And if you're organic, I don't think you can use a synthetic salicylic acid, but you can make your own by taking willows, chopping them up, putting them in water, letting them leach into the water, and using the salicylic acid from the uh, leaching of the, uh, of the willow branches and leaves. Phenols and mycorrhizae. Okay, so what's this saying? This, this says that the mycorrhizal fungus that is a beneficial symbiont, that is a partner with the root, of which 90% of the world's plants are now uh, mycorrhizal dependent, either ectomycorrhizal, which live on the outside of the root, or endomycorrhizal, which parasitize the inside of the root. The mycorrhizal fungus is incredibly important because of a couple of big things. Number one, it produces a lot of a, uh, a plant glue exudate called glomalin. And glomalin doesn't break down, so it builds up organic matter, up to 40% of the soil's organic matter is from glomalin. It also insulates the plant's roots so that they're not susceptible to diseases and insects, salt damage and such. And these mycorrhizal also produce phenols, phenolic acid. Anybody ever hear of phenolic acid or phenols? It's used as a preservative because it kills bacteria. And there's a whole family of phenols, they're part of the flavonoid family. Uh, but phenols are excreted, they're secreted by these, these mycorrhizal fungus. Unfortunately, the, you, you can't see it, but those dark shaded areas there are actually phenol deposits coming out of the mycorrhizal fungus. And what this shows you is total phenols of uh, mycorrhizal infections and on ground nut roots. And what this is showing you here is the mycorrhizal inoculated, the non-mycorrhizal inoculated, and these are different phenols. So here's a total phenol, here's a particular kind of phenol, and this is the fact that these are mycorrhizal infected roots and none of these are infected. So you look at the two columns here, and what do you see? Huge increases in the phenol expression out of the mycorrhizal fungus on those roots when they're inoculated. So if you're growing hort crops, I would always inoculate your hort crops with mycorrhizal inoculants. If you've got a perennial polyculture, you're already there, you just don't kill them. The best way to get rid of mycorrhizal fungus is apply too much phosphorus. Number one detriment to mycorrhizal, uh, uh, getting rid of them, is apply too much phosphorus. Uh, the worst kinds are the most soluble phosphates. So liquid manure, uh, superphosphate. You guys, are, if you're organic, are not using that. Some guys are a biological. You might be using some MAP or DAP or superphosphate. That's soluble. I'm not, I'm not talking about adequate amounts but abundant amounts. When you start getting the soil profiles up high, we're finding out as the mycorrhizal levels start to drop off. And the reason for that is because the primary job of mycorrhizae is to produce phosphatase enzyme. Phosphatase enzyme fractures the bond between phosphorus and iron, phosphorus and aluminum, phosphorus and calcium, and phosphorus and magnesium. 
So its job is to release phosphorus, and the reason for that is because the energy currency of all plants and animals and people is a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? So mycorrhizae's job is ultimately to create our energy currency. And, get, and so that's the number one way to get rid of it. The second way to get rid of it is a lot of tillage, no cover crops. The third way to get rid of it is fungicides and herbicides. You know, so those are the ways you drive mycorrhizal out. Thank you for joining me uh, for this week's uh, podcast. As you can see, um, you know, my, my passion for what I uh, do and uh, I think the passion that our team has gathered really stemmed from Jerry Bernetti. And uh, without Jerry, we wouldn't simply be here. Um, you know, I, I show a picture of Jerry uh, and me. And, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, we started working in the late 80s. Um, cell phones didn't exist, you know, smartphones didn't exist, cameras in your pocket didn't exist. So as we were going through some work, we realized there's just not a whole lot of photograph, uh, photographic evidence of our partnership, our business partnership. Uh, but we do have this one picture that I share at a lot of times in the, uh, in the academy. This is a picture of, of me and Jerry at one of our very first trade shows. And as you can see in this picture, uh, there is my uh, wonderful porn stash uh, and Jerry in the same jacket that he wore almost every time. Uh, but we scared a lot of people in the first few days of, uh, of, our, uh, of our business uh, of Earthworks. Um, you know, we were coming out with ideas that were different. Uh, you know, 1988, 1990, there wasn't a lot of people talking about biological soil management. Um, but Jerry's passion was powerful. I understood it. Uh, I followed it. We stayed on that train. And, um, you know, and today, um, you know, it's, it's very rare to find a, a manufacturer of fertilizers not talking about carbon, uh, things that we talked about, um, you know, with great pain uh, back in the early 90s. And what I mean by pain is that we were criticized heavily. Humic acids was the uh, work of the devil. They were the snake oil. Now I think they're in some of the most uh, common fertilizers that you're going to find. Uh, fortunately, we have continued to grow with Jerry's concepts. Uh, we can continue to stay with a lot of his formulas. And, uh, and we continue to share his conversation. And that's what we were trying to do today's podcast. And we're going to continue this as well. So please stay with us um, over the next few months. Um, I will pull together another Jerry Bernetti piece. And thank you for joining us on this week's Earthworks podcast. These clips were taken from two talks that Jerry gave entitled Understanding How Nature Works and Soil as Superorganisms, both given at a conference called Land Care Australia eight years prior.